Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. There's an acronym which I learned, uh, unfortunately, much later on in my career, which is WIIFM. This is probably the most important message I can give over to your audience, Will. It stands for what's in it for me. Sales is a profession which, in my opinion, is the most important profession in the world, bar none. But it has really the worst name. (laughs) No um, mother says when her baby is born, I hope my son or daughter grows up to be a salesman. Hello, Sales Nation. My name is Will Barron. I'm the host of the Salesman Podcast, the world's most downloaded B2B sales show. On today's show, we've got an incredible episode. We have Freddie Frundlich. He's the author of The Art of the One Call Close, which you can find on Amazon. And on today's show, we're getting into how you can close the sale before you've even done your sales presentation. I know that seems like a a massive claim, but it's all explained in this episode. And so with that, let's jump right into it. Today, we're going to get into, amongst other things, and I'm sure this is all going to go down a particular funnel, which the audience will become aware of as we go down this funnel, but we're going to talk about how we can close a sale before we even do a presentation to the potential customer. Now, that sounds pretty crazy, right? But I think we're on the same wavelength that we should be trying to close the sale before the presentation, right? Uh, definitely. Uh, I um, One of the things I've learned in sales is that pretty much whatever you think you know about sales throughout the window. Uh, there's an acronym which I learned, uh, unfortunately, much later on in my career, which is WIIFM. This is probably the most important message I can give over to your audience, Will. It stands for what's in it for me. And that is a gene which I personally believe that God instilled in us. Everybody has this gene called WIIFM. And uh, the reason why I I am on your show today, bottom line, is because I believe there's something in it for me. You are hosting me because you believe there's something in it for you. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people might call it selfish. I say it's win-win. That's what the world is about. Now, uh, in a sales, when you go into a sale, what you have to be thinking when you walk in the door, not only are you thinking what's in it for you, the salesman, but more important, what's in it for me, meaning your prospect, the customer. And if you can do that walking in, and just focus on that, you will actually sell the person before they even know what you're selling. And I can honestly tell you, Will, I've, have, I've had a very di- diversified career, and I've had people not even sure what I'm selling, and they're already ready to buy. Do we need to, I don't want to get too meta here, 15 seconds into the interview, Freddie, but it seems like we've all got this um, uh, you know, selfish gene, whatever you want to call it, this thing that makes us want to think about ourselves first. Do we need to reframe ourselves as salespeople as thinking, well, if I can help the prospect first and put myself to one side for a second, I'll win in the long run because that's how I'm going to win my commissions. Because I feel like a lot of salespeople go, well, I'm here to close a deal and that's all that matters. But perhaps we need to reframe this, right? Yes and no. Uh, Unfortunately, sales is a profession which, in my opinion, is the most important profession in the world, bar none, but it has really the worst name. Mm -hmm. No um, mother says when her baby is born, I hope my son or daughter grows up to be a salesman. They want a doctor, a lawyer, high tech. Nobody wants to be a salesman. And when you walk into a cocktail party and uh, they say, what do you do for a living? You say you're a salesman. You don't get the high fives there. So you have to dress it up. You have to say, I sell Lear Jets. I work in high tech. I do this or that. But sales is not only the most important profession. It is the most honorable one if you're an honorable person. Every profession has its crooks and con men. Unfortunately, because in sales, you don't need normally a license or a degree or really any education, we attract a lot of lowlifes. 
But real professional salesmen are just that, very professional. And what we do for a living is we solve problems. We solve problems and make money. We're no different than a priest, a rabbi, a, a clergyman. We have a bad rap, but we're here to help people. So by me going in and helping you, I'm helping me. It's a win-win. I don't have to put my interest to the side. My interest and your interest are the exact same thing. You know, if I, if somebody would look at my website and your website, they'd say, you guys are competitors. Why are you sitting down? Now, first of all, I don't believe I'm a competitor of yours. We're in the same world, yep. but a totally different business. But many people would think, well, why would you want to be on his show? You're only promoting his show. But no, it's a win-win. I'm here to help you because I know you're here to help me. And that's what the WIIFM gene is about. People automatically think it's about being selfish, but it's not. If I help the old lady across the street, am I doing it for purely altruistic reasons? I don't believe so. I'm doing it because I feel good. That's not bad, but I'm I am doing it for me at the end of the day, even though it's helping others. Every invention that has made our lives better. I was just seeing something, a, an article, I read an article on Thomas Edison and Nicole Tesla, the two people who invented electricity. Mm -hmm. And they changed the world in ways that boggle the mind. At the end of the day, they did it for themselves, but they helped millions and eventually billions of people. So the WIIFM gene is good. And if you are selfish and only care about yourself, then it won't work because you have to inherently care about everybody for it to work. I hope I'm not rambling on too much. Nope, here. makes total sense. Uh, I, think okay. we, I think we're on the same wavelength here. You okay. just are a far better speaker and better with words Thank than you. what I am. <laughs> so, so with that said, Freddie, how do we use this then? What uh, What's in it for me principle to close a sale before a presentation or where I think we're going to end up the show? How do we use this to close a sale on just one or two phone calls? Okay. So the, the basic thing is this. When you go into, uh, when you speak to a prospect, whether it's on the phone, it's uh, through a, a Zoom or Skype application, or it's face-to-face, -face, it's in person. It doesn't matter if you're selling pencils or you're selling Learjets. It doesn't matter if it's B2B or B2C. At the end of the day, you are selling to an individual. Now, that individual may represent an entity, an organization, a company, but it starts with an individual. Every individual and every entity has what I call a PowerPoint. A PowerPoint is either something very painful, very painful to them, or it is a burning desire. Everybody has something. Right now, if we were to go into it, Will, I would find out what is the number one thing on your mind that you're hiding from your audience that is either your burning desire that you want more than anything else right now or something very hard that's going on in your life which is hurting. Now, sometimes people ha can have a combination of both. Sometimes people don't even realize what it is, but we all have something if we probe deep enough. Now, my job as a salesman is not to sell product or service. That's an after. My job is to solve a problem. In fact, many of the uh, products and services that I've sold in my career, people did not want when I walked in the door. Sure. And that's very common because if they want it, they wouldn't wait for salesmen to show up. In other words, I don't have to be sold petrol, gasoline. When I'm running out of gas, I pull into the gas station to fill up. But if I didn't know what gasoline was, I would need somebody to come to me and teach me. So we are teachers. So when I walk into a business or I'm speaking to a businessman, um, part of my job, depending what my product or service is, is to educate them on why this is good for them. Now, in order to do that, I have to understand who this person or entity is. So an example I like to use a lot is 
if I walk into a um, a uh, a business and the businessman is grumpy, he's just not being a nice person. There has to be a reason why he's not being a nice person. Now, I am selling, let's say, um, a CRM, a contact uh, management uh, system, a software system. So, um, but he is not happy and he's grumpy and he seems just out of it. There's no way I am going to sell them no matter what I have. So I have to find out why this guy is grumpy. When I do my research, I find out he's grumpy because I ask the right questions in, in, in the right way. And I find out he's not getting sleep at night. And he's not getting sleep at night, it turns out, because he has bed bugs in his mattress. Now, how quickly do you think I am going to become his best friend <laughs> if I solve his bed bug problem? Of course, in an instant, right? In an instant. The last thing we're talking about is the CRM. Now, in most cases, I, because I have met a lot of experience in this, I can actually make the connection between buying my CRM and solving his bed bug problem. But that's for another day. But right now, the moment I've solved his bed bug problem, I have him in the palm of my hand. I'm not going to put a gun to his head to buy my CRM. But he trusts me. He believes me. It's the easiest sale you'll ever have. But if I walk in and I ignore the person and I go right into my CRM, I'm wasting everybody's time. Plus, he'll never have me back. See, one of the things salesmen don't understand, and they think this is old fashioned, but it doesn't change. You'll never have a better chance to sell your product or service than the first time you're there. Every time you make a repeat visit, your chances get lower and lower and lower of ever closing the deal. I mean, there's a few things here that I feel like we, sh we should uh, not gloss over. One of which is this idea of, of trust ready. Is trust on solving someone's bed bug problem, then, does that then translate to a, a CRM solution? What I mean by that is, if we get a potential buyer to trust us for one thing, does that mean that they're then almost inadvertently trusting of us as a human to talk about other projects or, or possibilities to add value to them as well? One of the things I've learned, Will, in my life that uh, nothing is black and white. But that being said, I would answer to you, yes. When you, if you think of somebody you trust very much, a parent, a sibling, a best friend, you trust them no matter what you're talking about. Now, you also understand sometimes that they may not be an expert in a certain fields. Sure. In other words, I, am, I trust my wife, but I understand that if, God forbid, I have a brain tumor, I'm still going to go to a brain <laughs> specialist. Because even though I trust her, I understand she is not an expert in this, but I trust her. I believe her. she's looking out for my interests. If I'm selling a CRM, the, the, the prospect in front of me either doesn't use a CRM and needs to be sold on the benefits of a CRM, or they're using a CRM and they want something better, cheaper, faster, whatever. Okay? If they're not using a CRM and I have become their best friend, of course they're going to trust me. Mm -hmm. Of course they're going to trust me. And then it's an easy sale because once I've showed them how a CRM will make their life better, how it will make them more money, do you think after everything we've been through they're going to go out and get bids and get you know price it out? Unless they're a government, they have no choice. Sure. They're going to buy my CRM. The same thing is if they're already using a CRM. If they're using a CRM and they're willing to consider another CRM, it means they're not happy. Nobody buys something new if they're happy with what they have. And again, it means that they've lost faith or trust in their current vendor. So they're looking for a new best friend. I've now established myself as a new best friend because people are used to salesmen being pushy mm -hmm. and selling. If I'm spending a third of my allotted time Trying to solve this guy's bed bug problem, he no longer thinks of me as a salesman. 
He thinks of me as an advocate, a friend. He trusts me. Now, this does not mean every time I solve a bed bug problem, I make the sale. But I can tell you, I sell. My closing ratio is the highest out there when I have the um, uh, when I have a qualified buyer in front of me, because I sell to their needs way before I get to my product or service. So let me ask you this, Freddie, and I'm sure the answer to the question is probably, Will, it's a it's another grey area. I'm sure that's going to be the the somewhat of the response here. But there's two. If we're looking at black and white, there is. One set of uh, sales experts would perhaps say that if you're not getting anywhere immediately with a potential buyer, hang up and pick up the phone to someone else or you know continue the sales process and just keep going and going. And it's a numbers game. And that might be fine for more consumer, um, you know, low ticket products. But I think we're talking about more relationships or sales that need some kind of a relationship to, to progress forward here. But on the other side, you have what I did in medical device sales, which was basically not really sell anyone anything, but spend a lot of time in theaters with surgeons, um, a lot of time out there with CFOs and discuss the finances and guide them and, and help them and do a lot of product training and essentially not really sell or close anything. And six months, 12 months, 18 months down the line, you know, a 500 grand contract comes through and the deal is won inadvertently just because of the amount of time you spent in there. It'd be crazy for them to even engage with anyone else, even though they perhaps need to get quotes and, and as you alluded to, go down the, the government pathway here in the UK of in the NHS of going through tender and that kind of thing. So how do we know whether we are spending too much time, um, I guess, kissing frogs that are not turning into princes or would being too savage with it all and going down the other route and just not giving it enough time or uh, occur to our potential customers to um, to grow them into a potential customer? Excellent question. Excellent qu question, Will. Um, first of all, as you said before, it's not black and white. And um, the, first of all, I, I will point out that regardless if we're selling uh, the consumer item, it's a one call close, walk in, walk out, or we're selling the medical devices, which are a two year process, we're still building relationships. How long that relationship will last is another story, but we're always building relationships. And uh, when you spend two years with a client, a prospect, and you're building that, you're just building a relationship. And yeah, it's almost a done deal. It's sort of like uh, dating. You date somebody for two years, um, and uh, at some point you announce to your friends uh, you're getting engaged, and they say, what took you so long? It was almost a foregone mm -hmm. conclusion, but there was still a sale involved. It was just a long-term sale rather than a short-term sale. So that, that doesn't make a difference. The time investment is just that. It's an investment. Uh, the one thing that we all have in common, regardless if we're the Bill Gates of the world or the guy who cleans the tube there, we all have the same commodity of time, 24 hours in a day. The only difference is the value of our time. And you need to know what the value of your time is. Now, um, a great example is this. I was once uh, consulting with a company where uh, they did telephone sales. And I had a, uh, a prospect on the phone, but all the salesmen that I was training were listening in on extensions. I spent close to two hours closing this guy for a 200 euro sale. Was it worth my time? No way. But it was worth my time because it was a training session. Sure. If I had been just a salesman, I would have said goodbye a long time ago because it wasn't worth it for a 200 euro sale. But it was an invaluable training opportunity because I showed uh, the salesman. You see, one of my uh, one of the things I teach is that um, there's no such there's only two things a salesman should accept a yes or no. A qualified yes or a qualified no. Most people do not give a qualified no. They say, I'll think about it. Let me mm -hmm. get back to you, whatever. Very few people say, no, I just don't want it. When a, when a prospect says, no, I just don't want it, you have to respect them, say goodbye, and move on. Well, this particular prospect would not tell me no. Would not. So I 
being that I I, uh, I, I, I claim to, to do this, I had to stay on the phone until I could get him to say either yes or no. And eventually I wore him down and he said yes. But it was not a good – in other words, again, I would not do it if I was a salesman. But as a teacher, it was a great lesson for them. So long story short, you got to use your head. What makes sense? And I guess uh, to get practical about this, Freddie, we could just split up our sales target to months, weeks, days, and then we know whether it's worth spending three hours or an afternoon on the phone with someone because we can translate that into, well, if this deal comes in, uh, I'm I'm up on the, my time investment or I'm down on my time investment. Is that a, a fair way to go about it? Uh, again, not not as simple as you would think because it would depend what it is you're selling. Meaning, and I don't mean so much what it is you're selling, but the the monetary worth of what you're selling. If you're selling things which you make ten euro a uh, um, uh, commission or ten dollars commission, whatever, well then you're just going to go through the numbers. Next, 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 yeah. next. But if you're selling things where you close the deal, you make yourself a hundred thousand dollars. You also want to see where you are in the year because if you're ahead of your um, uh, goals. So why not take the time and uh, close? I personally, I am a one call close salesman. It doesn't mean I close everything in one call, but that's what I shoot for. That's what I advocate for. I don't really uh, like to go back to close a sale. Obviously, there's some things we do go back and and close sales. So um, again, a gray area. It just depends on a number of, of, of areas. I, I want to say one thing, Will, uh, before sure. we continue, though. Right now, we're talking about a lot of details because I know the people listening to this podcast are salesmen and they want to know bottom line. How do I do this? How do I do that? But before you get into any kind of um, of uh, of uh, of um, details, a salesman first has to define themselves as who they are. I am a one call close salesman. That's how I am defined. So I approach everything with that in mind. And that's what I think a salesman has to do before they even start selling is understand who they are. Okay. I feel like that's a three-hour conversation that we can have in the future, Freddie. I want to because <laughs> I want to pull things back to what we started with here, or we, we okay. kind of half went down the route of, and that is perhaps the audience, Sales Nation, perhaps they've got a presentation coming up next Monday morning, and they want right. to do as much of this as what we're discussing so far as, as possible uh, so that that presentation goes well and they can close the deal at the end of it. So what would be the starting point if someone has booked a presentation you know, in the, the COVID era that we're living in, perhaps it's a, a Zoom presentation or a demo of a product. Um, and, and there's, you know, the, the the potential customer is ultimately qualified. It's the right person. They've got the budget. They're looking for the product. What can they do to make this as simple and as seamless of a presentation so that it's, it's basically closed before they even uh, pick up the phone? Okay. So first of all, will you hit the nail on the head? The most important thing in the beginning is to make sure you have a qualified buyer or buyers. You never go into a presentation if you do not have the qualified buyers, which means if you're selling, for instance, um, um, B2C, you uh, have a, uh, uh, there's a wife involved. Don't take the husband's word that he makes all the decisions. Make sure the wife is there too. And that doesn't matter if it's Zoom or it's uh, face-to-face. So you want to have all the decision makers present if possible. You want to make sure that they are qualified to buy. Once you know you have a qualified buyer, again, depending on how big a ticket item it is, a smaller ticket item, you will invest less time. A bigger ticket item, you will invest more. If it's a bigger ticket item especially, you will try and do a little research before you go in. Today, things are very simple. We have social media. Look at LinkedIn, Facebook. I understand you are the uh, the, the most handsome uh, salesman out there uh, <laughs> through Facebook. Okay, you do a little bit of research. It takes five, 10 minutes. See if you have any connections in in uh you know in common do your basic homework all right now you may already know before you even get on that zoom phone call about this person you may be able to go right into something which will um which will help you close the sale 
assume, whether you do or you don't, when you start that meeting, there are roles. It's the roles of being a driver or a passenger. The person who is the driver makes the sale. Now, just like you're in a vehicle, it doesn't matter what, only one person can drive the vehicle at one time. If the passenger reaches over and takes the steering wheel, chances are you'll have an accident. So you must retain control all the time. The, the prospect, he or she wants to retain the, uh, the control. There's an old adage, everybody wants to buy, but nobody wants to be sold. Nobody wants to be sold, and they feel you're a salesman. So you're immediately, when you walk in the door, and you're doing it virtually, but you're still walking in the door, they have their, their defenses up. So the best way to get their defenses down is throw them a curve, what we call throw them a curve. And what the way you throw them a curve is you look for something that has nothing to do with what, they're, what you're selling. But that's not what's commonly referred to as the icebreaker. Don't start talking about the weather. Don't start talking about something which has no interest to them at all or something crazy. You want to get to their bed bug problem. Now, again, it doesn't have to be a problem. It can be a burning desire, something that they really, really want. What would be, sorry to interrupt, Freddie, but what would be an example of a question that we can ask that? Because in our mind, we want to probably ask, what's the most painful problem you have at the moment? But clearly, that's a, a weird question to ask someone in, in the beginning of a Zoom call, right? Okay, well, if, if, I were, if I were trying to sell you something, sure. based on the little I know of you, I know something that, I, that you probably want. I don't know if it's a burning desire, but just like this, um, this conversation we're having now, uh, in all fairness to the audience, I knew one thing about this conversation. I knew what the title was, correct? Correct. That's all I knew. Yep. You had some notes, but you still, as you said, we're going to take this conversation where it goes. Most salesmen rely on what, what is called a, uh, a script. They have a, a, a canned script. Well, I have notes where I want to go, but I, I have no idea what we were going to talk about in this podcast. I knew the direction, but I didn't know the details. That's being natural. So you have to be natural. So you have to look for something you can hook on to and start the conversation going. I can imagine that there are certain people that you would love to interview on your podcast that in, right now they're out of reach for you. Would that sure. be a fair assumption? That'd be fair. Okay. Now, if I could help you get one of those people on your show, would you appreciate that? Yeah, that'd be value added okay. to it for sure. You see where we're going mm -hmm. here? I get it. I, I never met you in my life, but I, I can already understand because of the business you're in, there are people that you would die to have on it. And if I can help you either directly or indirectly, I am making a friend of yours especially if i'm selling coffee cups you see you are expecting if you know what i'm a, want, want to sell you and i'm now talking about helping you book uh bill gates on your show you're like what is this guy doing i thought he's here to sell me coffee cups now i have to know when to make the bridge and how to make mm -hmm. the bridge and again that is a three-hour conversation but what we're talking to the people who are listening to this podcast, what they're going to do next Monday morning when they walk in, they're going to look for a hook, some way they can get the conversation going to where they can find out what this person they're looking across to, what their PowerPoint is. Again, their burning desire or their pain point. Let me tell let, tell me if I'm on the right track to this. I feel like okay. inadvertently I'm doing some of this at the moment. So we're selling some podcast sponsorships uh, for the show, and I always anything that we sell as a, as a company. I'm we've got a small team here, but I always try and get on calls and and do a lot of it myself, just so I'm not some talking head talking nonsense about sales. I'm actually putting some of this into practice. Now I'm finding a lot of these conversations that I'm having that inadvertently, and now I'm pushing them towards talking about paid advertising as a whole. And then I narrow things back down to 
um, advertising on the podcast later on in the conversation. And the reason I'm doing this is that we're spending 20, 30 grand a month on paid ads. And this is actually a lot more than what a lot of the sales enablement companies that were selling the podcast advertising space are spending. So I'm starting the conversation by asking about paid advertising in general. Usually most people are doing a bit of AdWords or they're doing this or that. And I start talking about Facebook ads and how we're having benefits from it. And then I do five, 10 minutes of coaching on what's working for us and explain it to them. And then it gets dragged back into podcast advertising. And I find that, you know, rightly or wrongly, this sets me up then as an expert to talk about podcasting advertising, even though we've been discussing a different form of paid advertising. So is this, am I on the right tracks of what you're prescribing here, Freddie, as a way to build trust before we go and try and close the sale itself? It's, it's, it's actually, Will, another track, but it's definitely an excellent track because that's exactly what you're doing. You're coming in and you're establishing yourself as an advisor to them. And as long as you're genuine, it's very important yeah. that people be genuine. Um, what, it, what you're doing is, for instance, I know a little bit about advertising. And uh, even though I've never sold billboards, I know a little bit about billboards. And I know it has to do with traffic. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, a billboard in itself can be worth a lot of uh, money to you in the right location, and it could be a totally waste of, uh, of time in another location. That's what I know about billboards. Well, if I'm walking into a prospect and I'm trying to sell them podcast advertising and I'm sharing with them and I'm saying, you know, if you have the money and you can get a billboard on Times Square, get it, take it. In other words, I'm I'm sort of helping my competitor, you would think, because if we're on the advertising, there's only so many advertising dollars. Sure. And if you salesman.org, if I am telling you, if you can have the money, go invest in a billboard at Times Square, I'm putting your interest ahead of mine. But I know deep down that you're not going to do that. But mm -hmm. I've set myself up that I'm trying to help you. And even if you do that, that means you have a bigger budget than I thought. Great. Advertise at Times Square. I'll still get some business from you. Either way, I come out looking like a rose. The point is, the key here is you have to be sincere. Because if they feel it's just a game with you, then they're not going to buy it. People do read people. Another quick key point, Will, especially in the, the era of Zoom and what's going on. And by the way, this is not going away. You know, People shouldn't think tomorrow we're going to yeah. get back to the way we were. This is a part of the new norm. People sometimes feel they can get away with things because it's virtual. People feel you the way... It, 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 the, the only difference between you and I sitting across from each other uh, desk to desk is I can't physically shake your hand. We can still have our drinks together. We see each other. We, we feel each other. And people have to understand that. Don't try and uh, BS the, uh, the prospect mm -hmm. because they will see right through it. So you've, you've touched on it already with being sincere and uh, not trying to, to, to bullshit the prospects for want of a better way of putting it, Freddie. So there's two things here that you, you mentioned that I thought were really interesting and I want to wrap the show up with this. You said we've got to ask the right questions. So we've touched on that uh, to a certain extent, but you said we've got to ask them in the right way. So other than being sincere in the way that we ask them, what other traits of uh, the, is there for the, the right way to ask a, a question? Okay. Again, it's sincerity and it's you have to be normal. Speak to the person not as a salesman, but being normal. And I realize this is very trivial and people might be listening and say, come on, get real. But let's stick to our bed bug uh, example. Okay. I walk into a, I, I either I walk in virtually or I'm face to face mm -hmm. and I have a meeting with a person. I expect anybody I'm dealing with to be civil with me. To be nice with me. So if, I, if I've scheduled a meeting with you and we've allotted 30 minutes, 60 minutes, whatever, and I walk in and he says, listen, I don't have any time. You know, tell me what you're selling and that's it. So there are very various ways you can handle it. You can try and sell them very quickly. 
you've lost the sale. You could say, well, let's reschedule. Mm -hmm. And maybe that might be the answer. Or you can say, is something wrong? Just ask him, is something wrong? Because obviously something must be wrong because he allotted X amount of time to you. And now, so, you know, then he will answer however he will answer. You see, you can't go by a script. When, um, I, I, when I train, I use a lot of analogies between relationships between men and women. So if somebody goes into a bar, if a man goes into a bar and his intention is to meet a woman, he may have an opening line, but if he scripts it, he's not going to get anywhere. He has to come across naturally. So um, he can't he script everything. And the same way here, you ask the guy, is something wrong? And the, hear what he says, but listen, don't, people don't listen. Listen to what he's saying, sense what he's saying, and um, go from there. That's all, that's all I can say is you have to find a way to just ask the next question. One question leads to another question. This is, uh, I've, I've never shared this before. I've got a post-it note here. It's usually stuck on the back of this car and no one can see it. And it's more for the training content that we do from the same studio here, Freddie, rather than the interviews because the interviews, it's easy for me to be normal because I'm really intrigued as to what, what you're going to say and I, I want to know the answers to these questions. But I found when I'm doing sales content and I'm talking or reading from an auto cue or talking at the camera, I have to have this sticky note uh, to remind me of how to behave and how to be normal. And it just says, Act like you're speaking to your younger self. So that's how I try and treat all of our of our content, and it stops me being robotic, and it allows me to be. Uh, it allows me to. I'm not sat visualizing myself sat there behind the camera watching, but just that little prompt to remind myself to not be a a salesperson or marketer or whatever role I'm in within the company at that moment. Just to be a normal person. That that has massive impact on then the content that's recorded at the end of all this. So. Let me let's wrap up the show with this, Freddie. If we could instill one thing into the audience's brain, Sales Nation, who's, who's listening or watching the show right now, is is the takeaway from this conversation that they should act normal in front of their buyers? What would be the one thing that they should be um, acting or being or behaving when they are engaging with their potential customers? Um, I agree 100% with what you said, but I would even say instead of acting is if you're talking to your younger self act if you're talking to your younger self's best friend okay you're what what, what before you when you're young and stupid and you don't care about what what everybody's telling you you have to be doing and you just really care and your best friend skinned his knee how would you react to him that's it that's the way that's what i would advise people that and W I I F M. Keep that in your mind all the time. Be genuine. Perfect. I love it. Well, that, Freddie, tell us where we can find out more about you and the book, The Art of the One Call Close. Okay. Um, first of all, there is my website, which is rabbifreddie.com. Uh, I am not, even though I do have rabbinical ordination, I am not a rabbi. I'm more of a business rabbi. So it's rabbifreddy.com, and that's freddy, F-R-E-D-D-Y, rabbifreddy.com. Um, you can get more information about me, my books. You can go to Amazon, and uh, I have a couple of books there. The book that I would strongly recommend to your listeners are The Art of the One Call Close, which covers a little more in depth of what we've been talking about today. Perfect. Well, I'll cover all that. I'll link to it all in the show notes this episode over at salesman.org. With that, Freddie, I really enjoyed the conversation, mate. And I want to thank you for your time and your insights and for coming and joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you very much. I was very happy to be with you. <laughs>